So, your royal highnesses, uh, uh, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was given the impossible task to link the two biggest problems of the 21st century, namely food security, in particular for the poor people, and uh, climate change within eight minutes. So, here we go. So, let me see. Um, let me start with this here. Johan Rockström already introduced you on a journey across uh, time and space. But this is an interesting diagram. You see on the vertical axis uh, global mean temperature, and you see it's minus 20 degrees or even more. And on the, vert on the horizontal axis, you have time in the past. So 100,000, 100 means 100,000 years uh, in the past. And I'll show you how the global mean temperature and these, the planetary conditions for life, have developed over that time. That is like this. Uh, you had tremendous fluctuations at that time. And when something happened 74,000 years ago, it was the eruption. The Prime Minister mentioned Sumatra. It was the eruption of uh, Toba volcano on Sumatra, the biggest accident in human history, if you like. Uh, and from genetic analysis, we can sort of infer that at that time, about a few hundred hu human people, Homo sapiens, still survived, a few hundred only. Yeah? When we move on in time, and you see how the tremendous fluctuations persisted. And I could explain to a meteorologist where they came about. When something happened, a miracle, a true miracle, you see that the climate is becoming stable, completely stable. And that's what we call the Holocene. <coughs> that is the time of man, really. And this made possible the first big revolution in our history, namely the Neolithic Revolution. So agriculture was invented. It could not have been invented during this wild fluctuations. Only in a stable climate it was possible. So this is what happened. From a few hundred Homo sapiens surviving, we have now 7 billion, and we are going towards 9 or 10 billion. Nobody knows. Yeah? Now, this is all about God's element, if you like, called carbon, the element carbon, because agriculture is only possible based on photosynthesis. And this, again, is only possible because you have lots of carbon in the atmosphere. But we also have lots of carbon in the ground through processes that have developed over hundreds of millions of years. Oil, coal, gas. And the second big transformation in human, humanity's history happened by tapping this carbon in the ground. So it's again carbon. And that was the Industrial Revolution, started in Lancashire in England, 1750 or so, and has really propelled the human enterprise into a dominating species on Earth. And by the way, the Industrial Revolution is not over yet. On the left-hand side, you see factory buildings in Manchester in the 19th century. On the right-hand side, you see a destroyed, a collapsed building in Bangladesh, where more than 1,000 people left their life. Huh? So the ugly face of the Industrial Revolution is all over the planet now. Now, what is the side effect? The side effect is that you have this is, again, global mean temperature, but if you look at the vertical axis, it's just tens of degrees, because we are in the Holocene. But at the end of the Holocene, where we are right now, you see a spike upwards. That is the human factor. There are still people who deny that there is a human factor, but this is not a natural fluctuation. If we go to the last 120 years or so, and this is the sort of wiggly curve of a physical entity, namely the global mean temperature again since 1880. And you see, of course, you have cooler years and warmer years, but the overall trend is only in one direction upwards. Huh? And you have 
cool years when a volcano erupts like Pinatubo or Toba. You have warm years with an El Nino. Actually, there is a big El Nino brewing in the Pacific right now. So 2015 is going to be the warmest year on record. Very appropriate for the Paris meeting. And you have sometimes, and we had that in particular in the past, La Nina years, uh, so the cooling in the Pacific, when you have some spikes down, but the overall direction is absolutely clear. So what does the IPCC say, the World Climate Council? On the left-hand side, you see the projections. If, if we have a successful year 2015, as the Prime Minister said, then we may follow the blue path here. We may stabilize the climate. Or if we do what is called so nicely business as usual, we will have a global warming of about four or five degrees by the end of the century. And that's not the end of the story, by the way. Four degrees by 2100 mean eight degrees by the year 2300. You cannot stop the climate machinery once you have started it. Very few people appreciate that fact. And on the right-hand side, there's a famous diagram uh, which tells you how you enter the danger zone in various respects. The left-hand side, it's threatened ecosystem like coral reefs. And there is also gl called global aggregate impacts. That's about food security. And you see, this is the two-degree guardrail. Actually introduced this concept to the now German Chancellor Angela Merkel in 1995. And it has become now a sort of global target here. And you see, if you hold the two degrees line, we are not in the safety zone, not at all. There will be coral reefs dying. But we will avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Now about uh, food markets, this is a recent analysis done by my colleagues. And it tells you with global warming, business as usual, by 2050, so the food prices will rise by 10 to 35 percent. Actually, the model, the Potsdam model, even predicts 50 percent or more. Now, it sounds like a sort of sober accounting thing, but raise 50 percent for bread or wheat and so on in developing world. I mean, you can have all types of things happening. Yeah? I think it's still a conservative estimate why. Now, I know why, because I was raised on a small farm in southern part of Germany, and what we really were afraid of were extreme events, you know? You can have a cooler year, warmer year, but what you're really afraid of is droughts, floods, storms, things like that. And we will actually enter a completely different regime of extreme events unless we do something about it. And that has to do with one of the factors organizing our weather, whether you are in Stockholm, where it is raining this morning, and it was a lot of sunshine last uh, evening. It has to do with the so-called jet stream. The jet stream is a ribbon of strong winds going around the planet in about 10 to 12 kilometers height. And this is more or less separating cool Arctic air from moderate air uh, in, the, in the middle attitudes. Now, what we have observed over the last year is that this ribbon, which is in general a straight line, is creating bulges, you know, wiggles, going south or north. That's what is called a Rossby wave. But the problem is, is Rossby waves under normal circumstances go away after two or three days. And when you're back to normal, but now we get stuck for four weeks, six weeks. In India, there's a heat wave right now. Eh? But we had the same thing on the left-hand side. You see what happened in 2010. You had a double whammy disaster. In Pakistan, you had this tremendous floodings where 10 million people lost their homes. And more to the west, you had the heat wave in Russia, unprecedented heat wave. Huh? So they are part of the same pattern. What we found out in Potsdam is that 
In a normal year, you have these sort of going south and north uh, Rossby waves, like a frozen lattice. On the right-hand side, you see what happened in 2013, and we see what, what we call a resonance situation, where the Rossby waves get stuck. This is increasing. Why? Because the, of the Arctic warming. The Arctic warms much faster than the rest of the planet, why? Because the Arctic sea ice is melting. And this means that you will have this situation much more in the future. Now, this is part of a concept I introduced some 15 years ago into the debate. It has been mentioned already, tipping points and tipping elements. And I'll come back to that a little bit later, just tell you what is on that list? It's the Indian summer monsoon, for example. It's the El Nino phenomenon. It's the Great Ice Sheet. And El Nino is extremely important. I mean, El Nino may cause the Indian summer monsoon to just stay away for one, two, three years. It happened actually at the end of the 19th century. It was estimated that about 35 million people died across the planet, not only in India, in China, in Brazil, in West Africa, and so on. There's a book written by Mike Davis, it's called Late Victorian Holocaust, a shocking title, of course, but I highly recommend it to everybody. So that is what is happening in India right now, you see. Business as usual, you cannot call that. Huh? This is a sort of zebra stripe melting away. And I show you the thing which is probably holding the fate of this planet, in their hands, that is the Greenland ice sheet. We have estimated that the Greenland ice sheet will melt, collapse in an irreversible way in a temperature range between one and four degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, we have already reached 0.89. Now, one to four degrees sounds like a big margin. Our best estimate is 1.9 degrees, actually. Yeah? So, Remember, 2 degrees as the global target, 1.9, where the Greenland ice sheet may already melt down. And I show you an animation of that. This is how it will melt away over hundreds of thousands of years. But once you have started this process, it's irreversible. Huh? So the time to act for the sake of the Greenland ice sheet is not in 100 years and in 1,000 years. It is now. And this is my take-home message for you, if you like. This is the slide. You know, in every talk, unless you have nodded away already, uh, the speaker has to wake you up at some point. And this is the point. Wake up, please. Because this is my current summary of the tipping points in the Earth system. You know, the science has, I recall that I had the privilege to talk to Crown Princess Victoria in, in Telberg, I think, uh, in 2008, actually. The science has tremendously advanced in the meantime. I couldn't have shown a picture like this. Today we can show a picture, and it's the following. The blue line is the global mean temperature development, as I showed you in the beginning of the last 20,000 years. Huh? We can reconstruct it. On the right-hand side, you see the global mean temperature development over the next 500 years or so, according to the various scenarios. The best scenario is the green one. It means you keep global mean temperature rise below 2 degrees, actually. That is the international ambition. Eh? When you have some intermediate one, but business as usual is the red one. This is the 8.5. And you see, it would propel us into this eight degrees world in the end. But on the way, we will cross many tipping points. And these are the tipping points. Sir. You can find your favorite one, the Gulf Stream, El Nino, and finally, the Antarctic ice sheet, which is about to melt at eight degrees warming. And that will add 70 meter global sea level. 70 meters, 7 meters. So what you see is, and that's the story for the policymakers, actually. Science can you t cannot tell you if we hold the two degrees line, we are safe. 
No, there will be hits. But if you go beyond that, you go into extremely dangerous territory where the tipping points accumulate. So it's like you are driving in a car and you have a, a bunch of stop signs ahead of you. And you just run over the stop signs and they accumulate. So it's like bang, 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 like this. That's the human journey unless we change our course. And the final remark is, because Gunhild gave its very touching introduction, actually my first wife had a similar experience, and so I felt very moved by what you said. Let me link this to the human body here. Often people say two degrees warming, my God, if I leave this room, it's probably five degrees cooler. So what's the big deal? Think of your body temperature. Your body is equilibrated by many processes to be just below 37 degrees Celsius. Yeah? At two degrees, you feel very uncomfortable. At five degrees, exodus. Do we want to have this exodus for the planet? Thank you very much. <laughs>